tell me what should we talk about? What is this event about and what would be most helpful for people? And it came up with four or five really interesting ideas. The three that I picked up, one, he said, the co-pilot said, talk about India. What's really happening in India from an AI perspective? Number two, what's shifting in AI? What's different this time? And third, what people in the room should do differently and think differently about AI to get better and move faster. On it. So that's what, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, by the way, I also asked AI to say, listen, uh, can you create an image for uh, this event? And the image behind me that you see is created by Copilot. Um, it, it actually gave me four options. The reason I love this one is because it brings the charm of Bombay uh, together with the current Mumbai that we're in, along with the future that's coming our way. Okay, so enough of Copilot. Let me get started. I've got five minutes, and I'm going to keep it very efficient. I'm going to talk about three things, uh, as, as Copilot suggested. Number one, why is India unstoppable today? Number two, why is AI becoming unstoppable every day? And number three, how can each of us in this room be unstoppable? Okay? Let's start with India. My favorite quote in India is by Ruchir Sharma, and I've quoted him enough. Uh, he said something that, uh, that is really interesting. He said, India is a country that consistently disappoints both the pessimist and the optimist. Consistently disappoints both the pessimist and optimist, but that's changing now. We're only disappointing the pessimists. And I can go through a lot of data points, and I'm preaching to the choir here. All of you know these statistics better than I do. But a few. Um, we all know India has got 100,000 startups, but India is producing 100 new startups every day, the highest in anywhere in the world. Every sixth AI researcher in the world, every sixth AI technologist in the world is coming from India. And by the way, that's a statistic you shared with me, Nosha. 25% of the new additions to the global workforce in the next decade will come from India. India is not just incredible anymore, we are credible as well. And, and we're really coming together. And beyond these numbers, India is now starting to dream big. And not just dream big, but we're going after our dreams like our lives depend on it. And that is going to lead this generation to change how we work, how we operate, how we think about technology. India matters to all of us, and I know it for a fact, India matters to all of us in this room, but we now want to matter to India. And I think that is the shift that we're seeing in India that at least I've never seen before. OK, let's quickly talk about AI. And Satya is going to go really deep into this, so I'm not going to go there. But I just want to quickly show you, about, show you a, lot, a lot of our customers who are starting to build on us. And our purpose in India is AI for everyone. We want to be India's most trusted, most innovative AI partner. And all the customers that you see on this chart, customers always vote with their feet. But if you see this chart, there's a march going on towards Microsoft. It's a real privilege. It's a responsibility that we take seriously. And by the way, this is not just uh, logos. We've actually pulled together 71 stories of first movers on AI in India. And we put together a book for you. That book is right outside the room. I would request all of you to pick that up before you leave. Uh, I hope these stories inspire you. And Devjani, thank you for writing the foreword. Uh, I hope these stories inspire you to, to think about AI in your own organization. OK. Last part of the conversation today, how can all of you be unstoppable? And I'm going to give you three calls to action very quickly. Number one, start learning now. This is my cute take on IQ. I call it AIQ. And I tell my teams, the opposite of knowledge on AI is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. All of us are in this illusion. Get out of that illusion now. Start learning every day. If you're not learning every day, you're falling behind. Number two, unlock productivity with Copilot. Copilot's actually helped me pull this event together. And by the way, I saved hours and days of time pulling that together, and I got all of you into this room. If I can do it, so can you. Don't, don't get left behind. And finally, don't dip your toes as an organization. Get started now. Don't wait for this technology to get fully baked. It's going to get baked every day. But if you're not building on this today, you're really falling behind. And of course, you need data, governance, and trust to come together for all of this to work. So in simple words, learn it, use it, and deploy it. With full credit to the hero on the ad from the 80s. But learn it, use it, and deploy it. It's as simple as that. So let me bring this together, and I'll then bring Satya in. Three messages I want to leave you with. India is truly unstoppable. This is a different country. We can all feel it. It's the most exciting market in the world today for technology. And we're all in this market. It's truly a privilege. AI is truly unstoppable. It's real now. We moved from stories to action, and there's real impact happening 
every day around us. And finally, all of us in this room can be unstoppable if we learn it, if we use it, and if we deploy it. And I urge, I'll urge all of you to do that. With that, um, I'm going to quote the man I'm going to bring on the stage. He said, uh, our industry does not respect tradition, it only respects innovation. And there couldn't be a better time in India, there couldn't be a better time in technology to think about innovation. And with that, it's an honor of a lifetime for me to bring to the stage Satya Nadella, Chairman and CEO of Microsoft. Thank you very so much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. It's uh, fantastic, as usual, to be back in India. In fact, it is exactly a year ago uh, I was here, and you know, obviously AI was in the air then, and AI is really, really is in the air now. In terms of rate of diffusion, quite frankly, I've not seen anything like this. Um, when I've thought about, you know, I've been coming to India through all the four big platform shifts I've been part of as part of Microsoft, uh, whether it is the PCs and client server, uh, subsequently it was uh, the web um, and the internet, and then of course mobile and cloud. Um, but this is the first time I feel the, what's happening in India and what's happening in the rest of the world, there is no impedance, there is no gap. Uh, if anything, the use cases here that I'll talk a lot about uh, are so unique uh, and are paving their own path, uh, and that's what's exciting. We're not just talking about AI, we are scaling AI, um, and it's a fantastic time uh, to be both doing and learning uh, from each other. Uh, the thing that always, whenever I think about new platforms, uh, and this is, in fact, the learning I've had, uh, having watched these four big platform shifts, is to be very grounded on what exactly changed, right? Um, because we can talk about change, but you have to sort of dimensionalize it in a crisp way. And I would say the AI uh, platform shift has two massive shifts. Uh, both of them actually have been the 70-year arcs of computers, uh, if you will, right? If you think about the computer age in the last 70 years has been this one continuous march to create a more natural user interface, right? In fact, the dream of the early founders, whether it is Vannevar Bush or Engelbart or what have you, was always, can you create computers that understand us versus us having to understand computers, right? That, I, and I feel like we have kind of arrived at that. Uh, with natural language, but multimodal, you know, that is video images, uh, text in and out, uh, and the ability to have arbitrary length conversations which are multi-domain, uh, I think we've really got a new user interface paradigm that's going to change pretty much how we use computers and what computers even mean. And then the second thing is, for the last 70 years, we continuously increased our digitization of people, places, and things. Because in some sense, Bill used to always tell me there's only one software category. It's called information management, which is you, every day you get up, you digitize a little more, and you make sense of the digitized world. Now we have a new capability uh, of making sense of that digitized world, a new reasoning engine, uh, which is a neural reasoning engine, which we can apply to an increasingly digitized world. And so these two things, a new user experience and a new reasoning engine, pretty much completely revolutionized the entire tech stack. Um, this ultimately is going to have an impact on GDP, right? Because at the end of the day, you can only talk about tech uh, as a real thing if it is going to have a real impact in the overall growth of an economy. And in, the, in India's case, uh, as Puneet was saying, definitely today this is one of the highest growth markets. Uh, you see it, the buoyancy of it. Uh, the government and all of you have high ambitions of what's going to happen even by 2025. Uh, and what percentage of that GDP growth is going to actually be driven by AI are all, I think, going to be very interesting numbers for us to track. In fact, I was recently came across a fascinating statistic in, uh, in the United Kingdom during the height of the Industrial Revolution they spent as much as 10% of their GDP on the railroad system. And then the rest, obviously, is history. But I think that's another understanding, which is when you have a new general purpose technology, how intensely you invest and deploy it cross-sectorally inside an economy, I think, makes difference uh, to a country's prospects going forward. And that's why that's exciting that we are at the early stages of this adoption cycle, but rapidly scaling it. 
Um, that's what we are focused on at Microsoft. Our mission is to empower every person in every organization in India to be able to participate fully. Uh, to me, that's what you know, gives me a lot of satisfaction is to see new technology but applied in unique, intense ways uh, across small and large businesses, across public and private sector, across every part of the Indian economy, across every region of India. That's what's uh, really our mission. That's why we have built this into the entirety of tech stack. People will say, what is an AI product from Microsoft? It's called everything from Microsoft. There is not one product, quite frankly, uh, because we've gone plumbed it all the way from the core infrastructure. It's fascinating. The more I look at it, you know, I get up in the morning and I'm reviewing some data center plan. Uh, the, everything from what we do on the concrete to the HVAC system to the infrastructure are all being defined by the power draw of AI systems. I mean, it's not about like any one product, but the entirety of what we do has been, is being shaped. Um, and the op opportunity of ultimately, though, you can even, you know, we used to talk about digital transformation all through cloud. That's effectively the same thing, which is the way we engage our customers, uh, with the way we engage, you know, the experience of our employees, the business processes and how they're optimized, uh, and the space of just raw innovation in any enterprise. All of these are the ultimate outcomes that we will measure ourselves by, right? So it's not about tech for tech's sake, but it's a tech applied for these business outcomes that I think more so than I would say even in the cloud era, I feel that the ability to tangibly say, what is the change in the business outcome? I think we are able to go to grok that uh, much faster. So it's exciting time for AI transformation um, and AI-driven transformation. Um, so in that context, for us, I would say there are three imperatives. If I had to sort of even look across what's happening around the world, uh, what we ourselves, quite frankly, are seeing inside the company, there are three imperatives of how you all can get ahead um, on uh, driving those business outcomes. Now, the first one is to just adopt some of these products like Copilots fast. Uh, it reminds me, quite frankly, of uh, the first paradigm shift I was part of, which is the PCs. Uh, you know, even, it's interesting, by the way, PCs are an interesting thing because if you even take some of these critiques of uh, the impact of IT and economic growth like Robert uh, Gordon. Uh, the one thing that he gives credit to is PCs in the late, eight, uh, late 90s when they became standard issue and part of uh, work, uh, they changed productivity. In fact, he will claim that that was the last time IT actually had a direct relationship uh, to productivity stats. Um, and obviously I take a lot of pride in it. But I feel this AI age is very similar. That is, it's diffusing, right? If you think about what PCs did, they brought information at your fingertips. This age of AI is really expertise at your fingertips. Think, you know, what happened to forecasting before PCs, right? Before email and spreadsheets, how did we do forecasting? Uh, and then how did the business process of forecasting change? Same thing is happening now, whether it is supply chain, whether it's sales, whether it's legal or what have you. When you can summon the expertise, it's the greatest silo breaker. And so that's why I think adoption of co-pilots uh, becomes critical. And we're seeing all kinds uh, of productivity stats uh, here. But all of it stems from this fundamental notion that knowledge turns inside an organization are changing, right? And you can come at it horizontally, whether it's frontline work or knowledge work, or you can come at it from business process, sales, service, software development, security operations. So the tangible way, you can, in fact, my biggest encouragement for you is to go deploy these tools, create a cohort, measure it yourself. That's it. Uh, because you've got to build your own confidence that you can sense it, see it, uh, and that way you can drive it. Uh, and so that's what I think is very much possible, and you see all of these statistics. Uh, and in fact, in, in, in India, uh, that's what's been most exciting for me. I've, you know, I've been sort of learning about all of these uh, use cases. IT services, at some level, you could say it's existential for any one of us, right? I was talking to Jensen the other day. He's got all of everybody uh, in NVIDIA is deployed uh, Copilot. Uh, it makes sense because he's, his thing is like, you know, like we will all be found out. In fact, the firm level differences will start showing up, uh, especially in tech, 
uh, in short order if you're not an early adopter. And so obviously that you see even with the IT services in, in this country uh, all going uh, fast and furious on it. But it's just not that. And in fact, I think Puneet had these uh, slides where there is adoption across the board, across every sector of the Indian economy, and it's exciting to see. Just to give you a flavor for it, uh, I was just reading up about what Axis uh, Bank did. This is one of the, the things that I sort of describe as the standard issue, right? Just like at some point, everybody, all of us sort of said, hey, PC is a standard issue. Copilot is a standard issue. That's what they're doing. So they're basically saying, let's take the ho most horizontal approach of having everybody equipped with a copilot so that every piece of knowledge work can be done faster. Somebody described this to me as lean for knowledge work. I think that's a good way to even think about it, right? Which is you're increasing the speed and the sort of alignment across organizations so that you can get things done with the least amount of time and effort, right? That's essentially the mindset. Uh, so that's kind of what Axis is trying to do. Uh, both um, uh, HCL Tech and um, uh, Mindtree are also adopting this, but they're also adding their own workflows into it, right? So it's not just the horizontal tools that are baked in. But in the case of HCL, a lot of their project management and bug triage is integrated into the co-pilot. In the case of Mindtree, even the insights into how they drive their staffing for various projects is plugged into it. So in some sense, it's not just the one workflow that we have, but you can steer it to the workflows that matter inside your enterprise and wire it all into this co-pilot. So co-pilot's understanding is not just what was prefabricated. It is what your enterprise is, and that's uh, exciting. And in the case of Infosys, the, 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 this is probably the, one of the bigger use cases of GitHub Copilot. Uh, GitHub Co in fact, if I go back into my own belief in this entire regime of AI, if you will, uh, all came about when I first saw GPT-3 uh, inside, or uh, what became GPT-3 inside of GitHub. Uh, co-pilot, um, and it's the most proven use case. It's the place where the productivity stats are most robust. I mean, it went from, I mean, remember, software developers are pretty skeptical people, right? It went from, uh, this won't work, to, oh my god, I can't live without it, uh, in the shortest amount of time. Uh, and it's exciting to see now, this is now being broadly deployed uh, even across organizations like Infosys. Now, the, uh, the next imperative, of course, is Adopt, so the first thing is don't reinvent the wheel, get the co-pilots that have been prefabricated, whether it's sort of for specific business processes like software development or security or the horizontal ones. Add your own data, add your own workflow. So that's, if that's number one. The number two is we are exposing all of the tech stack we use to build our co-pilots to you as first class Azure services. So that means there's nothing magic about what we did because you can take that same thing and apply it to anything you want to build do Nuvo as far as your own AI products. Uh, and so that's the second imperative. This co-pilot stack uh, from the bottom to the top is available to you. Uh, so for our investments here obviously start with the raw infrastructure itself, right? We have more regions than any other hyperscaler around the world in, in the India itself. Uh, we have uh, three regions already forthcoming on line. We have the two regions with geo, so we are definitely investing to make sure that compute with low latency at scale, including all the AI is available uh, for all of you to be able to take advantage. We're investing a lot, as I said, in making sure, in fact, when I think back, having started uh, in our cloud group, you know, what now 15 years ago, um, I, I sometimes sort of wake up and sort of can't recognize even the core system architecture. It's so rapidly changing. So we are investing a lot in making sure that the AI infrastructure, whether it's for large model training or small batch training or inferencing, uh, how do we make sure we have the best performance on it? Uh, so that's something that we're doing across multiple, and, and having diversity of silicon uh, as well. So we are very, very excited about the progress and some of the benchmark data uh, that we have seen uh, is very, very, because here's the thing, right? People talk about the death of Moore's law. Let me tell you, Moore's law is very much alive when it comes to AI, right? What used to be, uh, you know, the cost curves of AI are only going to come down. So that means a set of tokens in and out today are going to ha follow the Moore's law. So that means when you're even thinking about your AI project, 
I, I tell my teams, don't worry about cogs. We can know we can optimize cogs. Um, and so if you want to be the most ambitious about being able to use this to create the most value for your customers, partners, and for the business, and then know that there is no other raw material in the world that just drops in price using Moore's law like this. And so that's, if you talk about business leverage, this is business leverage. Um, the next thing is we have the raw infrastructure, but then we have these models, right? So these are like the foundries of this world, right? So therefore you have the, lot, we have the, the best uh, model today even, right? With all the sort of hoopla, you know, one year after. Uh, still, GPT-4 on NNLU, take your benchmark, and anyone still is better. Uh, we're waiting for the competition to arrive. It'll arrive, I'm sure. But the fact is uh, that we have the most leading uh, LLM uh, out there. Uh, we have all the open source models. So it's not about, like even Copilot is not about just uh, open AI models. Uh, in fact, we use a combination of models uh, in any of our products, which is what all of you will use. So we have, in Azure, the best of open source models, the best of frontier models. Uh, we also are innovating in what is called the small language models. In fact, one of the best, if you go to Hugging Face today, uh, you'll find that uh, Phi is the leading small language model. Uh, and it's a pretty cool research uh, finding, right? Which is you can take a slightly different approach uh, to learning, as opposed to thinking of all tokens as equal. If you took a cognitive approach to, like for example, the original book, or the original paper on uh, transformers was attention is all you need. Uh, the paper we wrote uh, was textbooks is all you need. Uh, and it's intuitive, right? When you're learning something, uh, you would rather go to a textbook and learn versus saying, let me learn from all the text that was ever written about a subject. So that intuition is what's leading to these small models actually performing on par with some of the largest models. So we're very, very excited uh, about the SLMs. These are the things that can run on, uh, on your phones and on your PCs, as well as obviously in the cloud at scale. And you can cost optimize, going back again to that Moore's Law point. So you can think about LLMs and SLMs all playing a role in how you build out your products. The, perhaps when I look at the thing that I'm most excited about, uh, is uh, what I think all of this can do for science and the acceleration of science. Clearly, I think knowledge work, frontline work, um, it, like whether it's software development, whether it's the everyday uh, knowledge work, will be revolutionized. But if I think about one of the pressing challenges we as a society have, is we have to take whatever, the 250 years of science, right? They'll take energy transition. We're not going to make it to the other side uh, if we don't compress maybe 250 years of development of chemistry into perhaps the next 25 years. Uh, so we need some new way to even change the scientific process and its curve. Uh, and that's where I think AI can help. Um, AI, essentially, the way we think about it is, like, if you want to simulate in silico, uh, that's where high performance computing is used, right? If you want to even simulate a single molecule or molecular dynamics, cells, and then all the way to complex systems. Of course, the real breakthrough there will be quantum. But the interesting thing AI does is AI is kind of like an emulator that, or it reduces the search space so that you can, for example, if you want to build a new material, uh, you can discover the new material or generate, in fact, generative diffusion models uh, like Matagen that we develop are allowing us to build new materials. And in fact, we round tripped one such example recently. We worked with one of the national labs in the United States and essentially generated a new material which reduced the lithium content in a battery by 70%. Right? I, and I really wanted my team to show me this, that this is a complete round trip. So it's not just, oh, we generated something in silico, but can you fabricate it and put it back into a battery. Of course, we're not a battery company, but think about this in the hands of somebody who is in the battery business, right? So you're not just building batteries, you're able to fundamentally change the frontier of science uh, that helps you build the next generation of batteries. This is happening in chemistry, it's happening in material science. Uh, it is going to start happening in biology. It's obviously drug discovery, you know, drug being able to generate new molecules for drug discovery are, you know, is easy. It's the drug discovery process which is going to be the more complex one. But nevertheless, we are definitely uh, very excited about what AI for science means. So we are now imp thinking of this as first class, just like as you thought about Microsoft 365 for knowledge work. 
you will sort of come to, and we'll do this through partnerships. So that's why I think it's very exciting in a country like India, where there is so much investment and so much capital going into the core basic science-driven uh, industries, to be able to really come help India leapfrog even some of the scientific revolution would be very, very exciting. Um, to harness all this, we're building the best tool chain. In some sense, one of the things that I take great satisfaction from is we are a tools company. That's how we got started in 1975, and here we are in 2024, and we get a real kick out of building the best tools for developers. Uh, whether it's GitHub, whether it's VS Code, whether it's the low-code, no-code tools and Power Platform, uh, all of these things coming together. And the power of all of this technology has to be democratized so that people can build applications at the end of the day. Uh, and that's what our goal is uh, with the entire tool chain. The other very, very important part of the tech stack is the data platform, right? So if you think about a reasoning engine, if you want to build an application, it's about taking the data you have and using this reasoning engine on top of the data. And so we are bringing, essentially, AI compute to all of the data in its, all its forms, whether it's operational stores, whether it's analytical stores, linking these two things in real time. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I'm very sort of excited about is a, a product called Fabric. Uh, and what we did is, it, I, I think of it as the product built for the AI age, because it separates out uh, the core storage from compute and with even the business model. So that means I can build an application which is using all the data in one lake, and I can have different types of compute. Sometimes it's SQL, sometimes it's Spark, sometimes it's Azure OpenAI. There are three different types of compute jobs that can all be brought in on the same data or different data uh, joins, if you will. And so that, to me, is a very breakthrough a uh, way to think about your data uh, in the context of AI. So uh, this is a, one of the, a lot of people talk about their AI projects. The first thing is you gotta get your data house in order in order to be able to get uh, the best value out. And that's why you see the adoption cycles even in India, even though the cloud adoption in India was a lot slower than what, uh, what happened in the rest of the world. But the fact that it has happened is what's helping anyone today take AI without any of that diffusion uh, impedance or um, delay, if you will, because you're already in the cloud, your data is already in the cloud, and you're able to rapidly turn it around and adopt something like uh, a new reasoning engine on top of that same data. Uh, lots of interesting um, uh, customer use cases um, uh, here, and, and I think Puneet had uh, many uh, of these examples, and I had a chance this morning to visit with a few of these folks and really learn about how they are going about building things. And they're really inspirational, right? Uh, uh, take, take Air India. Uh, if, if, what Chandra was telling me is how he's really instructed the team there to accelerate everything that they're doing, right? Essentially, from lack of, um, he was telling me, you know, they're just putting in all of the systems uh, that had like a lot of deficit, but rapidly getting into uh, you know place where they're leading. In fact, going, going from not having systems to leading with some of the experiences. So the thing that they built, for example, was an agent, an AI agent for the customer. It's one of the leading uh, uh, products uh, out there. So if you go to the uh, Air India home you know homepage on the web, you can speak to this uh, AI agent, complete your entire transaction and travel planning, and they have like high ambition on it. Uh, and they have on the back end of it as well, they're also creating a bunch of agents to streamline the business process, not just on the front end to the consumers. I had a chance to meet with the ITC team that they're building this, um, uh, essentially a bot for the farmers uh, to be able to then get all the knowledge they need, uh, because in some sense, in a vernacular language to be able to access all of the information and to be able to even take action, uh, right? This is the other very interesting site, uh, this, or rather interesting dimension to this, which is it reduces the expertise required to use n computing and the knowledge that is accessible, right? So that is why I think in India, w the most exciting thing is for the quality of all Indian output to go up because it sort of helps t reduce the barrier. I think that that's going to probably be uh, an example in, in farming. Um, Arvind, 
uh, they're, you know, this is a fascinating use case. So they obviously uh, have been in business for 100 plus years. And here they are using AI to, for example, for their legal department to say, let's make sense of contracts faster, let's understand risk, uh, and what have you. M very obvious use case. After all, any lawyer or anyone in the legal department who spent a lot of time uh, trying to assess uh, risk on any given contract, the easiest use case is to just be able to use Gen AI to think, you know, make sense of it. But the interesting thing is for their commercial teams to effectively summon the legal expertise Right, right at the point when the contract or the RFP is even being issued. That's the real transformation. The real transformation is when the expertise silos are broken. Right? So you don't have to wait for finance to, at the end of the quarter, tell you all the mistakes you made, or for legal to tell you all the risks you took without knowing. Right? So it's the ability to bridge that expertise gap just in time. That's why I kind of think of this as lean for knowledge work. Uh, that's what they're doing. Um, and then the last example was very inspirational. Like last time I was here, I saw the, the, the demo of Jugal Bandi, and I spoke about it many, many times because it was just a, a drop, you know, it's like drop the mic moment for me to see how this digital public good and Bashini combined with Jugal Bandi was being used to transform lives of people in rural India speaking in vernacular languages. Uh, and being able to not only get access to information and knowledge, but to take action, right? That, I mean, talk about human agency in the age of AI being enhanced. That was an example. And now the team has even built a fantastic thing called Jugal Bandi Studio, which is a no-code, low-code tool uh, for people to be able to build these bots and make them available to all of the uh, uh, social entrepreneurs, the nonprofits who are doing things. Um, and so I had a chance to meet uh, the folks uh, from uh, one of the nonprofits or the social enterprise called Agami, and they built a thing for uh, migrant laborers coming in uh, and for them to be able to access uh, this information. Uh, it's called Bandhu. Uh, so therefore, you're somebody who comes in from, say, rural Andhra Pradesh into Bangalore is the example they showed, and sort of in, uh, speaking in Telugu, perhaps getting access uh, to information on how they can get housing, how should they go about getting the right terms, all of the things. Then think about the sort of, you know, reducing the, um, I would say, the stress of being able to get to services when you come into a new place across uh, the, 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 you know, across India is fantastic to watch. The empowerment it gives to the end, you, uh, the end citizen here but also the empowerment to all of the social enterprises to be able to use something like this to make a real difference is fantastic to watch. Um, so those are some of, some of the, fan I th that, the ability for you all to build your own AI applications has never been easier, never be, and, and I see it at scale in India. So that brings me to the last imperative, which is ultimately trust, uh, because in some sense, as we talk about AI, we've got to talk about safety and trust as first class part of it. Um, it. It has a couple of different dimensions. The first one is the dimension of security, right? Because again, just like how data is important, securing your entire AI estate is important, whether it's the endpoints, whether it is the identity, uh, whether it's infrastructure or your applications. This is where the zero trust environment uh, that we have sort of evangelized and built the product suite for uh, becomes very, very important because you can't talk about security. You've got to operationally operate it, right? Or that you have to have an operational security posture that matches your rhetoric around security. And uh, this is everyday exercise. Uh, as somebody said to me, you can't get fit by watching others go to the gym. You've got to go to the gym. And this is uh, a place where you've got to practice that. Um, the second uh, piece is uh, the safeguards that we have put in place. Because one of the questions people ask is, look, in this age of AI, who's, who, what, what, what's happening with my data? Is my data my data? It's absolutely your data will always be your data. Uh, your data is not used to enrich anybody else's models. Um, uh, your AI model, so if you build, let's say, a fine-tuned model and you deploy it, it's protected by using the same security boundaries that we talked about. Uh, and also our commitment to copyright uh, indemnification. Because at the end of the day, uh, this is all going to be a, you know, a societal decision effectively. What is fair use? What's the transformative use of data? Uh, very important, by the way. It's fascinating to watch countries like Japan and others take a, a very enlightened stances uh, around copyright. 
uh, because they have sort of seen what has happened uh, you know, in other paradigm shifts where perhaps they overregulated. Uh, so I think this is something that I think each, diff each country will choose its regime, the global norms will emerge. Uh, but copyright is something that we are uh, very much on the forefront of in making sure that there's indemnification directly from us. Um, and then the last thing is, of course, the responsible AI framework. And even here, the, you have, what we have done is we have the principles. We have taken those principles and translated them into a set of standards. And those standards are implemented uh, as a set of processes, starting at the engineering. So these are not just things that we talk about, but they're core part of the engineering process. And we have an audit function, right? Because it's not just about saying things that you literally have to have an audit function where you go in and say, are you managing the process the way you said you are? And so this is how we are approaching it. All of this is available as effectively a set of services for you. So whenever you are thinking about building your own AI applications, you can go ahead and implement effectively a robust, responsible AI framework uh, around your own AI development. So, uh, so that's really uh, the three imperatives that I at least wanted to share with you. Um, I, I want to wrap up where I started our mission at the end of the day is to empower every person and every organization in India uh, to be able to achieve more in this age of AI. And in that context, I'm very excited today to even announce a new initiative around skilling. Uh, we are going to equip 2 million plus uh, f uh, people in India with AI skills. Uh, we think that obviously at the end of the day, uh, really taking uh, the, the workforce and making sure that they have the skills in order to be able to thrive in this new age is the most important thing that any of us can be doing and we are you know, happy to play our role in it. But it's not just the skills, but it's even the jobs that get created. And in this context, I was very inspired when I had a chance to meet uh, with the folks behind Caria. In fact, it was uh, the founder of Caria was telling me about how a lot of the research that you know was the, the foundation of it came from Microsoft India. Uh, Microsoft research in India, it's fantastic that it's now translated into this thriving uh, organization that is taking essentially what is AI tasks of labeling uh, and bringing those jobs, very you know, well-paying jobs, to rural India um, and being able to really create economic opportunity uh, that is pretty unique. And it's fantastic to see not only people in, you know, who are software developers participating, which we know GitHub, for example, in India, has more AI engineers. Or AI, the AI engineering community is second to the United States in India. Uh, but to even see that ru in rural India, people are participating uh, in the AI economy uh, thanks to the work uh, of organizations like Karya is fantastic uh, to see. And so let me, I think we'll roll the video and you'll get a chance to meet some of the folks uh, who are part of this. India has 22 official languages and Marathi is actually a language that is spoken by millions and millions of people. But unfortunately, many Indian languages are under-resourced. We cannot let language be the thing that does not allow you to use technology. AI is a transformative technology. People deserve to have access to these amazing technologies in their language. Kara exists to accelerate social mobility in rural India by building AI-based solutions to help our communities our workers record sentences in their mother tongue on their smartphones. And for the simple task, we pay them nearly 20 times the Indian minimum wage. And that leads to a data set, so they keep on making royalties every single time those data sets are resold. I think it is imperative that if we are changing someone's income structure in this way, that we also need to help them understand financial literacy. आणि <laughs> Karya's platform is hosted on Azure. We use Azure Cognitive Services for our own AI-based validation work. And we're also using Azure OpenAI 
मला खूप आनंद वाटतो मला खरंच गर्व वाटतो की माझा आवाज कुठेतरी कोणतरी ऐकणार आहे आणि माझ्या मी मराठीत बोलले त्याच्यामुळे कोणीतरी शिकणार आहे मला अभिमान वाटतो इफ यू कॅन सॉल्व इट फॉर इंडिया यू कॅन सॉल्व इट फॉर द वर्ल्ड uh anyone may have your mic flowing around uh, just raise your hand and we can put this question back to you yeah go ahead ma'am there's a mic behind you i uh, thank you very much satya my name is nivriti and i have uh, worked for intel for 30 years uh, last 5 months ago i joined invest india the government hired me and i can tell